Okay, everybody does need to turn on their video, okay? Video camera. Um, because I do want this to be something of a learning community, right? These are people, these are not just talking heads. I mean, we have talking letters, we have talking faces, and we have real honest to goodness people, right? Well, talking letters is just doesn't cut it. <laughs> Unless you're in Afghanistan, all right? Then I, then I you can get away with it. Um, that's right. If you're eating, it's okay, Jason. I just uh, told Mary Hannah that's okay. Um, because I, I have empathy with that. Um, all right, is Trajan there? Okay, so we're gonna have to have a few other rules, right? If you don't turn your camera on and you don't say anything, that's an absence, <laughs> right? If I can't see that you're there, it, it don't count. Um, what about uh, Lekesny? Can you turn on your camera? Okay, so if you don't, okay. Oh dear. Okay, so I, I'm i not much of an authoritarian person, but all I do is, okay, you don't get credit for coming. <laughs> um, I do think, you know, I'm going to ask those of you to remember you know, let me know via email when you finally remember how many times you've come. Those of you who are not here at the moment, I want you to send me an email saying how many classes have you actually come to? And then if there's some reason you couldn't make it, that's fine. But uh Daniel, I understand it's four in the morning, but you still have to come, okay? Uh, okay, let's see. So today we have two articles and you are required to have bought the books, the book, and that was a long time ago. If you recently joined the class, I did scan the first two chapters, but it's against the law. For understandable reasons, you can't make any money if everybody just scans everything. So you must buy the book. And we do have readings from the book later in the semester. So you will need it. You will keep using it. Um, all right. And it is not expensive, OK? <clears throat> um, all right. The I will try to read your papers in the next couple of days. I have 25 class hours, contact hours this week. So if it's delayed this week, next week, I don't have that. I only have 15 contact hours. So it will, things will settle down a little bit. Um, okay, so Mary Hannah, what you got? Um, I emailed you, but I've never saw a place to turn in. Right. What happened was you have to scroll up further because I clearly forgot to put that assignment on the last time I taught the class and I don't know how to insert an assignment. Okay. The only option it gives me is move to the top. <laughs> and I don't think you'd want that way at the top. Um, so, but that's a perfectly reasonable question. And, you know, your grade is no lower. You didn't really have to hand it in till after today anyway, so. It's so under we, paper one. What? It's under paper one. Yep. Okay, that's it. sorry. No, it's, it's, you know, it's perfectly reasonable. Um, and I think you didn't know that I don't know, and I'm not sure there's an option for inserting a new assignment in any place you want to. Um, if anybody knows how to do it, I'll be happy to um, 
Okay, so it's Monday. Um, we start out with your reports on your papers. And these are formal oral presentations. And I had rubrics for you. Um, let's see, paper rubric, speaking rubric. So, and I told you I had that rubric. Um, so what, what are we looking for? That it's organized. Uh, you present the information in a logical sequence, which the audience can follow. You deliver it, right? And again, you know, there's a difference online. You can deliver, you have to stare at the camera. Um, and then the subject knowledge, you show that you do know what you're talking about. So you've read it, thought about it, and you have a central message or a thesis. So that's, that's what we'd be looking for in an oral presentation. Um, all right, so I will. And then I would like the rest of you, of course, to, um, to ask questions. And I will, you know, I will make a little note of whether you're participating in the class and your participation and your presentations are part of the grade. I can't remember how much is the grade. <laughs> I'm just tired of um, a stick. I don't like sticks like, ah, I'm gonna get you if you don't think. So please just, <laughs> Just ask a question, you know, it's not, this is stuff we all think about, I hope. Um, all right, so I will start, let me start with um, Caitlin. Okay. One second. <laughs> okay, so. I did my paper over, so the title was Free Thinking America and Athens. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah, it was kind of just mostly like opinion and I also tied in some other things. But so one of my like biggest points was that throughout my entire life, my parents have always like encouraged me to think about all aspects of like life and like opinions that people tell me and things I hear like in church or at school or anywhere and they always wanted me to like never just believe what I hear and always to think for things like for myself um whenever like I came to line uh it was kind of a, a like a culture shock because I came from a very small high school that was everyone was um like extremely conservative and there wasn't a lot of differing opinions and if there was then they like they weren't accepted. So um, two of the largest factors um, that have really like challenged my thinking was the Black Lives Matter movement as well as like the presidency of Donald Trump and like all things that surround that. Um, so where I tied in, I talked about Socrates and how whenever they said that he was corrupting the children. I didn't agree with that because how we talked about, they were just hearing different ideas that differed from maybe what their parents or what society wanted them to believe. And I think that, um, sorry, I'm really bad at presentations. You'll get better. <laughs> um, How, like the not questioning what people tell you can lead to like authoritarian top government and how it basically would just ruin a democracy like Athens and I feel like I relate to Socrates in that way because I question people and it doesn't matter like what party or anything I don't like to believe what people tell me um and I thought I said that specifically in like Southern America, I feel that children are not really encouraged to have an open mind, 
especially when they got like come from a small school like I did and go to like a div diverse college um let's see I think that also I've seen a lot of kids who graduated with me who went to school and developed some opinions that were different from their parents and their family just treats them differently and doesn't accept them and I think it's wrong to do that just because someone has a different opinion not just saying from like a parent to kid standpoint but just even like classmates and things that as a person like in society you should say like if you're giving your opinion like this is my opinion these are the reasons that back it up you can agree with me or not but like just like state your stance and then if they agree with you good if not good you just have to find the middle that way that we can fix things and make things better but yeah so I guess that's it <laughs> okay people need to ask her questions now somebody uh, for a comment uh, I don't have a question, but I do go along with the fact that like people have their own kind of like things they believe in and like you don't have to always agree with what somebody's saying and that's not always going to be the case like just because somebody thinks one thing is right, you don't have to think it's right too. like you can definitely stand your ground and, and believe in what you want to believe so I definitely agree with with that statement right there. Okay, anybody else. Does anybody have a paper that's similar to that so they would want to, to read next? I'm gonna get you, so you want me to get you now or later? Come on, guys. Well, okay, well then I'll do a, I'll, I'll do Michael, I'll do gender differences, and then I gotta, you know, play it, play it fair here. Go ahead, Michael. I feel like there were a lot of guys that you could have chosen instead of That's me. true. Uh, I know. That's all I'm saying. Um, anyway. Um, so I, my, I guess, prompt, uh, although I kind of veered a little bit, uh, was the um, write a paper on whether you think coming to college or doing the reading and reflecting for this class is enabling you to gain more knowledge, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it had a, it's a very long prompt, so I'm not gonna read the whole thing. Um, but one of the first things I did was, I mean, obviously we talk about what a liberal arts education is, um, but I did go to kind of like research that more in depth um, and, um, well, not necessarily more, I mean, it was somewhat more in depth. Um, and so I talked a little bit about, you know, the, 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 some of the main goals of the liberal arts education um, and one of the things that I found which was one of the things I quoted was that the aim of a liberal arts education is to produce a person who is virtuous and ethical um, because I feel like that's not that's not one of the the I guess the definitions that we typically hear um, but I felt like that really went along with um, some of the stuff that we've been studying um, in terms of the class. I think that there was like a, a really big connection there with um, the readings we've been doing and um, being um, virtuous and ethical. Um, and then um, I talked about how um, coming to college that we all experience some form of um, liberation in one way or another. Um, and we discussed that in some of like the earlier days of class, uh, how many of us, um, whether it be from like our friends or family or our parents, um, like we had some pretty like, um, not like stuck in stone ideas, but like very, you know, cemented because of the people that we were around and how, um, coming to lie and you're kind of able to um, think and change these different ideals that you've made um, and how this is an example of freeing the mind, uh, which I talked about with, within the word liberal. Um, and um, then I discussed critical thinking uh, because that's been, uh, well, not only is that a huge part of the liberal arts education, but it's also been one of the, the big things that we've been hitting on. Um, and so, 
Um, I discuss critical thinking in reference to some of Aristotle's virtues. Um, so like, um, you know, dealing with, uh, not dealing with, but, um, with patience or tempers or bravery um, and how, um, you know, using critical thinking um, helps us to maintain um, staying in like the means of some of these different values, which again, one of the things we discussed in class, not a whole lot, but what was the idea of staying in the means? And actually Caitlin mentioned something at the very end of her talk about, um, about the means. And I don't even know if she meant to, but it was interesting. Um, and um, so I talked about how these like means uh, the Aristotle uh, discusses are kind of uh, put forth as a sort of gold standard um, and how um, one second. Uh, oh and I discussed how like that like that idea was completely new to me like I had never heard anything about like staying in the like staying in the mean between the you know the two extremes um, and how um, I think that like part of the liberal arts education um, is almost like an unconscious, like you unconsciously begin to live in the means uh, with your different, your different, uh, you know, personal values. Um, and I talked about how I think that like I have become more conscious um, about the means, um, but um, also talked about the relationship that critical thinking plays into um, um, us being more conscious of um, these different things. Um, and then I, obviously I wrote my paper before doing today's reading, um, but after I did today's reading, um, one of the things that the first reading said was, um, this, this isn't in my paper, but I just wanna, um, it talked about how the process, process of natural selection where our conscious processes later become unconscious. I mean, I felt like that was very like parallel with what I was just saying, how like I've consciously become more aware of the means, but how eventually that kind of becomes just part of the sub, our subconscious. Um, and then I also talked about, um, so one of the things that you were, you were telling us, Dr. Beck, was how we all have skin in the game um, and how um, like before this class, like I kind of just, you know, went through life and, you know, my classes like somewhat indifferently. Um, but um, after doing the readings and uh, understanding different things and parts of our society and democracy in general, um, we do all have skin in the game. Um, and I talk a little bit about critical thinking um, and how it's a prime example of um, how we can, you know, continue to elicit some changes that we want to see in our society um, and how it's like, a, it's like a prime example of one of the things that you can get from a liberal arts education. Um, emphasis on can, because I think that if you don't want to think critically, you, you don't, you don't, you don't. Um, and then um, I also talked briefly about um, parallels between line faculty and Socrates and how, you know, the line faculty should, as some, in some juncture, um, they almost need to exhibit some of Socrates' tendencies um, in questioning us as students and to make us question other things, again, to elicit critical thinking, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that was, that. yeah, that was a pretty good rundown. Okay, somebody has to have a comment or a question. Yeah, oh, go ahead. You can go. All right. Um, I think um, Michael had a pretty good, uh, he hit on it pretty good. Kind of um, when we come to college, it, uh, he mentioned it was like a liberation kind of. And I also read somewhere too um, that like most of the students who go to college, their, their views are more liberal when they come out, when they leave college. So I guess it's kind of like, um, a question to everybody or whoever wants to answer you don't have to um like is, is that the same for you being here now in college is it more of like um did you come in as a liberal and, and you're liberal or did you, i mean you don't even have to answer the question directly but is you kind of um like it, going to college did it kind of like how caitlin said like was it a culture shock for you um 
seeing how things were, uh, especially that we're here at Lion and um, we're given where Lion is in the South. So is it kind of like different for y'all or is, is it just how you guys imagine it would be? I'll speak. I, um, I think it also depends on how much you've been exposed to. Um, like you see a lot of different things around Lion because it's very diverse. And like for those people who haven't been exposed to a lot of things or experienced a lot of things, I bet it can be like overwhelming and it kind of is like a culture thing, kind of how Caitlin talked about. But I think, I mean, I do agree with that, but I think over the years you learn to judge less. I don't know. I don't know if it's just liberally minded, but you kind of get used to your surroundings and it just kind of makes you okay with more than you probably were before you came to Lion. I think it's kind of interesting because I know people that like um, live like live in like very liberal um, areas and they come to Lion and they're like, whoa, this is so conservative. And I know people who live around Lyon uh, in very conservative areas that come to Lyon and they're like, whoa, this is really liberal. Um, so I think that's a really interesting like dynamic um, in that aspect. That's a nice thing about Lyon because more and more small liberal arts colleges are getting to be like social clubs, okay? And they really highly ranked schools don't have the diversity that Lion has. Lion really does have a lot of diversity um, compared to most liberal arts schools. So, um, so that's, a, that's a great gift. And part of that was when we started getting more athletes because they get recruited from like California and Hawaii and <laughs> Chicago. And I had a student who had two uncles that were in the Black Panthers, right? And so he's in a discussion group with a girl from Cave City. <laughs> and, you know, like that's really a dream liberal arts school, right? So I, whatever else you might think of Lion, really statistically, that is the great, one of its great treasures that will never be in the advertisements, right? They're not going to say that because somehow that doesn't sell even though it's the substance of the school. <laughs> yeah, well, whatever. Okay, it's all about whether you can get a job or whatever. Um, but I hope you treasure that and I hope you realize there are not that many. Um, also, there, there are politicians trying to, to kill liberal arts schools because they know this statistic. Um, I can't remember what they were doing, they were either cutting funding or they were bringing a whole, there's a whole army of people who are, you know, saturating liberal arts schools to try and indoctrinate students uh, on one particular side of the spectrum. But that's all right. You know, college students, they think for themselves, you know, whoever comes on campus, you should, you know, you can listen, but you should know you live in a period of history where this stuff is really, right, controversial. Um, okay, so Trey, I would like to call on you. I, I didn't really want to put you on the spot after you went and made a nice comment. But uh, then it was sort of like, hey, we're being ignored. So it's your turn. Do y'all hear the background noise? It's all right, it's okay, it's all right. So I did mine over uh, the Martin, Martin Luther King thing. And mm -hmm. um, I was trying to find a good like title for it, but I really couldn't, but I kind of I kind of put like, I, I put my title as the truth, trying to find a result. So I started off with saying, basically, so what I, what I believe in, what the King was trying to say, is basically like, of course, he was all trying to like bring us together, but he did it in a way that nobody else would do it. Um, he 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 was kind of just the first person to like really speak up and, and say something about it. And I just find it really like noble that he really did that and chose to do that. But I mean, it wasn't just him; it was definitely uh, other people that acted along with the act. And so it said, uh, I said that King was often wise to avoid saying too much, basically trying like not to touch on 
you know, uh, people's beliefs and thoughts too much. So, you know, of course, everybody has their own things, and what, but you don't want to say the right, the wrong thing to aggravate somebody and, and cause a commotion. So I talked on that a lot. And I believe that, you know, because people have a, a different type of saying and feeling and what they say. So what I think is uh, when when he was saying that, basically, he was just trying to trying to say it in a way that he could really reach out to others and and get to get to, I guess, get involved in what they were saying and try to like, kind of try to, you know, capture what's really going on and help them really understand what's happening. And um, with following that, I put to love your enemies, regardless of what happens, uh, because you don't want to always hold a grudge to somebody and make somebody, you know, make yourself feel bad on, on, on an occasion to where you don't feel comfortable with talking to somebody on something like that and holding grudges really isn't like my strong suit or anything like that like I don't I, I never want to have like um a, a relationship to where it just doesn't work out or like I hate you or you hate me like I don't want to hold that because that just doesn't seem right and it doesn't seem fair to like other people or to myself because we all have to like grow up and move on and there's going to be tough times to where we have like moments like that, but regardless of what happens, we just have to keep moving forward and live our life. And uh, I talked about, uh, it's a, I said, so in, in the passage, it said every day I meet young people who, so we talked about like church and religion basically. So it said every day I meet young people who's disappointed with the church turned into outright disgust. So I think that meant was basically like people don't really like they, they call on God and they ask God for help, but maybe they don't think that he's really listening and understanding, but God is always by your side. And, and you know, somebody, somebody is always there to watch for you and, and look over you and stuff like that. And I really do believe that God is the person that, that does that for us. And so it, I, I think what he was trying to say by that was um, don't really like, don't, don't, don't disregard God's feelings towards you and don't think that he's not there for you because he's always going to be there for you. And he's always looking out for you pretty much. And uh, he lived a life. So with, with the king's life, he lived out a life that embodied the truth and, and basically asked us all to do the same in our own like context. So with that, I would say, with that, I would say like, it's, you know, the, the truth is somewhere, whether you think it's there or not, it's always something that's going to help us figure out what's going on. And if you're, if you have your own truth or you believe something is truthful, do it in your own way. Like you, everybody has their own way of doing things and, and, you know, do, yeah, pretty much that. everybody has their own way in doing things. So if you believe something that's right, you don't have to follow others just to get your way out and, and see it as their way. But if you have a different way of doing something, you can definitely do it on your own and, and make sure that, you know, it gets out to the truth and, and it's there. And that's what I got so far. But I'm probably going to add more to it. That's just like bits and pieces of what I had in, in my uh, essay. Okay, somebody comment. Um, so in some of the classes I've taken, when people are referring to uh, Martin Luther King Jr., they refer to him as like a transformational leader. Um, these people have like different characteristics, but I think you did a great job. Like, like you explained the ways in which uh, Martin Luther King Jr. exhibited the um, ideals of a transformational leader. So I thought that was really interesting. Not uh, interesting, but good. Anybody else? Yeah, um, kind of glad that uh, Trey brought up the whole grudge thing. I think that's one thing. We, um, I think people. We as people in the whole in the society as well, um, and we tend to hold on to things that that are like um, trivial, things we shouldn't be holding on to, and things that we should let go because like um, there's I, what we call what we call like rent free, like you like you worrying about what somebody else is doing is like kind of like a waste of your time and your energy, and what you could be putting forth into something else. It's like you wake up every day and you're wondering, oh, I wonder what this person's doing. You know, I don't like this person so much. I wonder what they're like you're you're so worried and so infatuated what they're doing like you could put that stuff like into doing something else you know maybe i don't know reading a book um going out with some family working out you know bettering yourself and i think that's i'm glad that uh trey brought that out because that's something that i think like 
we as a <clears throat> as people as as a society as a whole, as a whole could work on is like grudges and just holding on to like little things that are trivial and like being petty kind of thing i guess you could say so i'm, I'm glad he brought that up remember that was one of aristotle's virtues it was two that's what i that's my job right the in relation to anger not getting too angry not angry enough if you don't get angry enough and you hold a grudge then you overreact right so that's one of the virtues and the other one was sociability don't be petty remember that so i i just feel like that's my job is to show you that the things that you normally talk about are actually patterns right and then so with trey i think it was just a one page was it my little speech that i gave at um yeah at lion so those are also patterns, right? He got fed up with institutionalized religion because it had turned into a social club, right? And he, he was Socratic. Remember, he referred to Socrates who made people uncomfortable. So, I mean, that's why I just picked those quotes. But, um, the, but we are gonna read the whole letter from a Birmingham jail later on. Um, but the other thing was the union of reason and faith. So I, does that make sense to you, Trey? Because I sort of had them in bold and then I, does that make sense to you? Yes, ma'am, it does. Okay, so, you know, you can work on it more if you want to, but your second paper can also be on, you know, a different aspect of the same topic. Um, so, uh, John Lewis, you know, I'm sure Trey, you've heard of John, you know, that John Lewis and he died. I don't know. I, I didn't know that much about him, but um, he had gotten beaten 60 times in demonstrations. <laughs> and I did watch uh, like a 50 minute thing about him. Um, yeah, my father marched, you know, in Selma, uh, but not that day that they all got beaten. It was after that that Martin Luther King called for a um, minister's march. So then it was all ministers because the idea was this violates God, right? People, people disagree on God's will. Does that make sense, Trey? But, you know, we know that people's natural capabilities have nothing to do with their race. And so our society was based on a lie, right? So as you say, Trey, he's living the truth, right? And anybody who accepts a society based on racism is just accepting a lie, right? They're living a lie. So, sorry, you, you know, it's a, it's a great topic. Someone else want to talk? I'll give my presentation. Okay, good. Just because I talked a little about sociability and I can kind of stop there and go into what I said. Um, so I kind of just did the prompt where it was like comparing Aristotle and Jesus. And then I kind of just gave my views um, throughout the examples. So I just compared. Um, basically, I did a lot of it with Aristotle's the ethics reading that was posted. Um, it wasn't the easiest to understand, but I did like spend a lot of time trying to break that one down. Um, to some things that I could understand and I compared it with a lot of, with the Bible I mean obviously that's um to me basically a story of Jesus's journey and life lessons and whatnot so um I think they both had about the same end goal um just to encourage humans to become better people and that's just kind of to live like they wanted to direct how humans live for the better so I kind of just with each paragraph did some comparing and contrasting and it was all um which i pointed out in the beginning everything can be interpreted different ways i believe that the bible is a lot of metaphors um and the way that i read it is because like when we spoke about um if your right hand causes to sin then cut it off like i took that a lot of people might take that literally but i took it as a metaphor you know if you keep doing what's over and over eventually you have to put a stop to it like just stop sinning um but i like that with aristotle as well um so i'll just give some examples um 
one example to me was whenever Aristotle and the Bible both say to honor the mother and father, but it went kind of in two different directions. Like the Bible tells us more, we're obeying, like kind of bow down to your mother and father and every disrespect, always obey. But then Aristotle goes into, which I quoted it, but it was a long quote. I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but basically says that um, you learn from your parents and it's a respect factor both ways. Like not just kids respecting their parents, but also parents respecting their kids and the fact that what they do are shaping their children and like to who they're going to become. And I think that um, listening and learning is how Aristotle like knew with reason that that's how most people learn and kind of adapt their own to their own virtue. Um, also thought it was really easy to compare because Aristotle um, seemed to believe in God, but he takes God's meaning and mixes it with knowledge and reason. He did state, and I'll read this one song. The highest things are the internal, the eternal things, the chain of being in God, and the highest part of the mind is that which knows unchanging things. So when I first read this, all I could think about was like history, like the lessons that we learn. And I took that as like the chain of being, and I don't know if that's exactly correct, but that's kind of how I read it and ran with it. So I comparing to America, I remember being in history class in like second grade. And one of the main reasons that we learn about history is for it to um so it doesn't repeat itself so we don't keep making the same mistakes over and over and I feel like that's kind of where I'm Aristotle sorry. was going with this I have no idea what that noise was if you heard that but um I thought that was really important because that basically explains where Aristotle got his virtue from or like what it meant and so going into social ability social ability because I thought that was very important it was one of his virtues so um he stated that social is putting up with minor injustices and slights for the sake of overall well-being. And I kind of thought that was different from the Bible. And if you want to um, compare Socrates or I always say it wrong, but um, so they, what they did was like, they weren't scared to be different. They weren't scared to speak out for, you know, what they thought was right or what they believed in, even though if it pushed people away from them. And I thought that was very unique because Aristotle was more of, I felt like wanting to fit in and it was more of um, making peace with people instead of, you know, pushing people's buttons because to push a difference that they believed in. Um, so I also thought that virtue and religion can both be brought about um, to each human in their own way. And it's very unique. So many Christians um, speak with other testimonies and um, it's basically like, to me, I, think that that's like the moment when they fully and faithfully like accept God as their Lord and Savior and so Aristotle says that virtue is connected with some aspect of human life so each virtue like your own virtue might be different because of your life experiences or what you've seen so it's kind of like not just your belief but your way of life like Christianity and what you believe in like through God it all is brought about in your own un unique way and I just think that that's was important to me I kind of brought it up throughout my whole paper just because that like stuck out like a sore thumb to me but um yeah so I just basically the end of it was their ideas of how humans should carry out their everyday lives are similar but basically Aristotle's rule of life are more lenient than those I feel like of Jesus like his is all mixed with reason and understanding of how humans actually are in today's world so that's basically where I went with my paper. So go ahead. Just I just need at least two students to react. Um, I can go, but I don't organize my thoughts very well. So, um, but I liked how you compared what um, Aristotle said about how. Um, there should be like a mutual respect between like the parents and children rather than what Jesus says is like obey your parents like I feel like in reality like at least today's world it's hard to just obey parents because there's so many like bad parents so it's just like kind of taking what the Bible says versus like the reality and the reason and just combining it and I just like that you pointed that out. Anybody else? 
I actually had the same thought that Caitlin had, um, but I kind of took it another direction. And like when I was growing up, like people were always constantly like respect your elders, you know, like respect anyone that's older than you. And I feel like um, like Aristotle's view, although this was with parents, like if you move it from parents to just people, um, how like as Caitlin said, it was like a much more like. I, like it just makes more sense um, and in today's society, I, it's just, I feel like it's just better overall that respect has to be um, two different ways, you know, but I had the same, same thought. Okay, well, another issue with parenting is it you can't get away with do as I say, not as I do, right? You have to model it, right? And you have to want to be good, right? You can't say, respect your brother. You see, I'm respecting, you know, it's just, that's not, that's not character development, right? That's actually a corrupting influence because the, the implication is you would never want to do this, right? So it's almost worse than not bringing it up. Um, but there, but actually the honor your parents is in the Old Testament. There actually is a quote where Jesus says, I haven't come to bring peace, but a sword. I will set parents against their children. If, you know, if your parents don't love God, you have to love God more than you love your parents. So again, I always hesitate on those things because I know about biblical scholarship and I know each book was written by somebody with a different agenda. And, you know, uh, like Mr. Buby would be able to elaborate on that. But, you know, the Sermon on the Mount is pretty standard. <laughs> and I know that it's pretty accepted as something Jesus actually said, you know, right? But uh, the, I have come to bring, you know, not peace, but I, that one I think is more iffy. But the reason it's in there, somebody decided to put it in there, is that sometimes your parents are wrong, right? And so... That is a problem, and it would make sense that Jesus would say not blind obedience, because he's not blindly obedient to the Old Testament, right? He's not blindly obedient to the religious authorities. That's why he got in trouble with them. So he's not advocating blind obedience, right? Um, but let's see, the other things I wanted to bring up was, um, oh, oh, another thing is, uh, Toward the end of that reading, Mary Hannah, it did talk about class, right? Aristotle is really concerned with a strong middle class. You can't have a democracy without a strong. And um, he talks about children these days are being raised really poorly because some of them don't have enough money and all they learn about is being obedient. They don't learn how to govern. And whereas rich kids are born Oh, governing, ruling without any legitimate reason, and they don't learn to obey. And so I that's a really nice quote. Do you remember that? It was toward the end. You might have gotten worn out by then. Yes, ma'am. I, I do remember reading that. He spoke a lot about education though throughout. Right. So so I mean I encourage the rest of you to I realize it was tough and all that, but especially toward the end, that long quote, because a huge issue in our country is ever since 1980, the middle class has been shrinking. And there's, I was just listening to public radio, uh, another big podcast about it. There's just a lot of stuff coming up about it because it really does disrupt societies like Aristotle says. And um, if there isn't a, an easy fix out of this because we are competing with developing countries for manufacturing jobs, right? Do we really wanna pay our workers 50 cents an hour like the Chinese do, right? Um, and on the other hand, we have robotics and then we have the gig economy. We have contract workers, huge percentage of the workforce is contract worker. They don't have no benefits. They end up getting below a minimum wage by the time they, you know, it's, it's agonizing, but in your life, you're gonna have to become part of that debate, right? 
because it is just going to be everywhere in the culture. Um, and all my job is just to say, you know what? 2,500 years we've understood this, right? This is an old problem. And that's why Mary Hannah, um, with the chain of being, he meant natural things because they occur according to a more order and pattern. But he also thought there were patterns in human affairs, but they're less precise because people have the power of choice and they can do things that are really stupid, right? <laughs> Like a robin would never fail to make a decent nest. But if you look at the average college students, uh, they foul their nest, you know? I mean, they, they don't make a very good nest. <laughs> and I mean, we are literally environmentally, we are fouling our own nest, you know? And animals don't, they don't do the, the crappy stuff that we do. So our behavior is a lot less predictable because we're by nature the rational animal, which means we have to choose. We have to, we're conscious of the power of choice. We have to use our reason in order to make the right choice. So it's because we're by nature rational that we do all these really stupid, irrational things. Does that make sense, guys? <laughs> so you have to, you know, I have to have reasons. You have to know why. Um, all right, so the other thing is that the disciples spoke out, right? Jesus spoke out, got in trouble, like Socrates, and, and Aristotle is more into sociability and all that. Yeah, I think he might also say, though, um, if it gets bad enough, right? Because he everything is a judgment call. So he did say you shouldn't make... You shouldn't change the laws too much or too often or people just lose all disrespect. But if it gets bad enough, right? But only if it gets bad enough. And so that is, right, you, I think you're, you're right about that. Does that make sense that Jesus, he confronted the Sadducees and the Pharisees. That's kind of like his whole mission was doing that i i mean i don't think he set out to they were just so corrupt that he he felt like that was his mission so he was always getting himself into trouble right yeah i feel like aristotle it was like a bunch of gray area like there was like yeah this is good until it's too much then it's not but if in this case it's okay and it was just like a lot of what ifs i felt like so yeah that was fun to interpret everything okay good um who else um wh who do we have left we have jason or love i can't remember his name <laughs> mr october <laughs> uh okay jason you got something um no i don't uh kind of like what i told you before class started i couldn't really like on a topic is and find myself like commit to it. I always always find myself running into other stuff like okay. Other, do you um, feel like now you're ready to do something? You know, they gave you good ideas. Um yeah, but like I still like I said, still like a lot of like ideas running through. So it's kind of trying to find it hard to like stick to one topic. But okay. So when you do get it written, I'm gonna make you present. So how about Lackenzie? Do you have do you have did you have your paper? Oh uh, no, I don't I don't have my um my topic either. Okay, so again, I'm gonna hold your feet to the fire. You'll have to present in a day or two. Um all right, and I hope the people who didn't make it to class who are listening will um get ideas, right? Um I also hope you sort of understand that the class is supposed to be a conversation um and so yeah you don't i hope you don't feel i that i'm too controlling right i don't really want to control the situation um so go ahead and and raise your hand or take your turn as much as you can try to make it comfortable um so the next thing we have is mr newland the biology of the spirit and I will 
um, show some of the quotes. I had another handout with more quotes and I cannot for the life of me find it. So let me read a few of the quotes that are not on that handout, just because these people, you know, most of them, I don't think they know Aristotle, honestly, or they would have referred to it. It's just really unfortunate that they, what they did finally decide is true after a lot of soul searching and experience, whatever. Well, you know what? That's what Aristotle said. <laughs> Do we have to keep reinventing the wheel? Uh, but I guess we do. I think part of that is Americans think, you know, that everything is new. When America started, we're going to recreate human nature. Um, but, okay, here's, here's the quote that I cannot find on my machine. It says, um, Overwhelmingly, individually, and collectively, we seek balance, right? We want to transcend mere impulse and reason in the sense of just using your brain. All right, so that, that should punch a button. Um, he also says his ideas are met, might richly inform many religious perspectives, and as he admits, they do not rule out the idea of a creator, but they don't require a, a view of a creator, right? So this is a main theme of the class is that I, this is indifferent to atheist agnostic uh, or any, any kind of religious view of a creator or Hindu or Buddhist. So, uh, so Mr. Newland's view is compatible with that. Um, another issue he brings up is his childhood struggle with guilt and obsessive thinking. So I've had a number of students who really identify with that. In his case, it was Orthodox, Juda Orthodox Judaism, but I've had other students who were raised very strict Muslim who read this article, you know, and it punched their buttons. Um, so there is that difference between a, an authoritarian way to raise your kids and a much more humanistic way. And the humanistic way doesn't have to be self-indulgent, right? It's just focusing on internalizing. You want your kid to want to be virtuous. So when they go to, to college and they have all this choice, they'll basically make good choices. Um, Oh, yes, he says that um, a sense, if you have a sense of oneself as a good person whose life isn't sacrificed for others, but is based around community and a person who uh, loves giving one a sense of self as a, your life is based around community and love, this gives you a sense of self that's the greatest pleasure anybody can have. We say virtue is its own reward. So again, Aristotle would agree with that, right? Your own, there's no gap between uh, selfishness and other regarding, right? You, you develop yourself in a relationship to other people. And as you help them flourish, you are flourishing. Like there's no separation. Um, Let's see. And then he emphasized being kind and neurosis. And the relation between science and religion is not a debate, but a conversation. Each one saying, you're here to stay, I'm here to stay. So let's find out how our relationship can benefit the world. He refers to Maimonides and um, Aquinas and Averroes. So Maimonides was Jewish who united reason and faith with Aristotle's virtues. Um, Aquinas was Catholic, but he also united the view with Aristotle. And Averroes was Muslim, but he also united his view with Aristotle. He wrote a commentary 
on Aristotle. So those were the additional quotes. Um, uh, and I think all of you have these quotes. So it combines evolution, right? It, it really unites science and religion. So I want to have each of you give a reaction. Um, so maybe I'll start. Uh, Lakesni, did you have a reaction to this? Did you read it and have a thoughts about it? Some reaction? Oh, no. What? Oh, no. Okay. I'll 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 catch you later on. Okay. Um. So, Mary Hannah, yeah. I'll go first. Okay. Some reaction. Um. To me, one of the biggest things is that I loved how he talked about how we need how we listen and learn like from other people and like that's how we better understand people and that's like basically what causes us to live in a world with less chaos more happiness I remember we talked about that too I thought that was cool um and then he also I was didn't really understand this one a lot so I put question marks on it to ask in my notes so when we're talking about revenge um I remember I don't know if it was you said it because I read along as I listen but it says when using science, it can justify why it's okay to have a society that feeds into like earthly things or why it justifies why you turn to Jesus. Um, I think you might have said that. I, I think remember. that's the second article. The second article uh, is on revenge okay. and forgiveness. Um, yeah, but hold that thought, right? We'll get there. Okay. Well, I'll just stop because I think the rest might be on the other one too. So I'll stop. Oh, okay. Um, anybody else want to volunteer? Okay, Michael, go ahead. Okay, so one, I didn't realize that we were supposed to note on the quotes that you had taken out. So I was just like taking out quotes left and right for myself. Um, uh, I, that's fine. You know, it's just, it's just like you can always pick your own paper topic. You can, you know... I want you to write, tell me what's on your mind. It's just that so many students are just way too lost. So I do pick out the ones that are you know, the fallback ones. So go ahead. Right. Um, so one of the like continual things we talked about was um, how, um, let's see, we have an awareness of the closeness of chaos. That was one of the things that I pulled out. And he talks a lot about, um, how like getting close to chaos and how that's kind of like a, a, a driving factor in us um, keeping our stability, keeping our equilibrium. Um, but then one of the things he also says, uh, he talks about is the butterfly and the flame and how we take ourselves with evil um, destruction. And to some extent we succumb to those, those things. And um, you were talking about like patterns. And I feel like this is what, like, one of the, you know, one of the things in the Bible is uh, when they're, you know, the, the forbidden fruit, you know, and we do, you know, they did succumb to that. And I feel like that's one of, um, an example of one of the patterns you were discussing. Um, and then I had one, more, I mean, I had a lot of stuff, but um, I had one more thing that kind of went with the, the patterns and that was, he made a statement, um, he was referring to his, his, um, I think his book, one of his books and his grandmother and talking about his grandmother and her, um, her death, her slow, slow um, walk to death. And um, he made a statement, the more personal you are willing to be, the more universal you are. Um, and again, I felt like that went along with the patterns you were referring to. Um, because um, when they were talking about like the more universal, it was how other people like one person sent him a letter and said something like, um, you know, your, your grandma is my grandma. Um, she just lived at a different time in a different place and a, you know, a different this and that. Um, and how that also kind of coexists with this idea of uh, just patterns over and over again. 
Any comments? Okay, well, um, that's the traditional humanism and traditional humanistic education is always about patterns, those kind of patterns. And they assume we do have a common humanity. So um, they, as they assume that um, people, fear drives people, right? People are afraid and they are aware that they're vulnerable, which means we're close to chaos, right? And that's why Aristotle said that learning how to, to have courage, to know when to be afraid and when not to be afraid is huge, right? And politicians will punch buttons to get votes, right? And that's really important not to fear too much or too little. And so human history is about people who are maybe rich and powerful and they don't think it's gonna happen to them. And of course it does. <laughs> like in Russia, the you know, war and peace, Napoleon is coming. And the you know, in Moscow, they're just totally oblivious to what's going on. So there's always the they weren't afraid enough. And then other times somebody is too afraid and they allow their country to get taken over by an authoritarian because they were afraid of stuff they shouldn't have been afraid of, right? The enemy, right? And so that's, so there's just many, many examples of that. And I think what he's getting to is that it, it gets in your body chemistry, right? And so our thoughts about what's, what to fear and what not to fear affects our body chemistry and then our body chemistry can affect our thoughts because it's this synchronistic effect. Um, but also we are social and political by nature. Remember those social and political virtues are part of our flourishing. So we can get caught up in a spirit of the times, right? Where everybody's afraid and you have to really resist being afraid if it's really an overreaction, a phobia or everybody's oblivious. Like for Socrates, the Athenians were way too oblivious, right? They thought, well, can't happen to us. And he's trying to go, <laughs> right? He's trying to get them to wake up uh, and they didn't. So they didn't think they could lose the war because they're Athens, but they did. So, um, so there's that. And then the other thing, is again, we destabilize our societies every time we sort of get fascinated with evil. And so, you know, college students do that. Like they go to a party. Well, okay, go to a party. Then they drink, right? Oh, okay, you know, it's not gonna happen to me, right? Then they, you know, leave the party with a member of the opposite sex and yeah, yeah, you read about this stuff. It's not gonna happen to me. Well, you know what? It does. <laughs> right? They are playing with fire when they do that. Does that make sense? I mean, to go to a party and to drink too much and then to get connected to a person of the opposite sex, if you're heterosexual, if you're some other thing on this, whatever, uh, that's just playing with fire. And I, I did, I don't boss my kids around, but I did tell them 85% of rapes are somebody you know and there's alcohol involved so do not do that right don't go drinking and end up in a room with someone of the opposite sex right because it can happen to you um but you all understand that guys right you nobody nobody in my classes plays with fire but these other students do right and it it's really a stupid thing to do <laughs> that's another one of those patterns right Michael. All right. So anybody want to volunteer to go next? Good, Trey. Uh, so going along with kind of when we were talking about uh, sometimes we we're afraid or whatever, but with politics and stuff like that. So I kind of had like a thing with me uh, when we were like doing the election and stuff uh, uh, last year or whatever. I, uh, my mom really wanted me to vote. 
but she had like like so I didn't really want to vote because I was afraid on making the wrong decision on who voting for like and then I don't really be keeping up with politics and stuff like that anyways on how it goes and stuff because to me I really just like to me I see it as whatever happens happens but like I, I hope and pray for the best that like somebody good is, is going to be elected so she was just kind of like for she was really like trying to force me she was like you need to go up there and vote for this person this that this that and then I was just like I don't really want to because I just don't want to make the wrong decision and, and put you know jeopardize like my vote jeopardize what's going on and stuff like that so I was just uh, talking about that with like being afraid and stuff like that with like politics and stuff. And then uh, I heard uh, talking about and the thing is like we seek balance. So I believe that somewhere along the way, everybody wants peace and and to be, uh, you know, treated as equals and stuff like that. And just, you know, have have, you know, everybody live their own life, not worrying about what's going on and how things are going to end up or if we're going to be in any hurt, harm or danger. So I do believe that we do seek peace. And then along with like what MH said, when it said when she said, um, listen and learn from other people, I, I, I do agree with that 100%, but to a certain extent, because somebody could be trying to, you know, prey on your downfall and kind of like tell you the wrong things and, and put you in a situation where you don't really want to be in. But I do believe that people are people out there are trying to give you the right advice and, and lead you into the right direction and stuff like that. And um, yeah. Okay. Comments, questions. Okay. I, um, I'll, I'll comment on the not voting thing. My uncle's like really big on the whole. Um, pe too many young people vote without knowledge of what they're voting for or about. And I think that we do get caught up with it like the social media side of it like we believe like so and so is posting here these reasons and we don't I think as young people we don't do it well I don't do a well enough job of going and learning about the things that I need to know about and educating myself and I just sometimes take off of what I do see on things that I can't depend on so I'll take fault in that go ahead Michael yeah, I was just going to agree with Mary Hannah. I think that like a lot of younger individuals, like actually, you know, I'm going to just say like a lot of people in general look at uh, politics superficially and they don't actually look at like certain policies and things that would actually affect them out of different political parties, um, which I feel like is something that is like important uh, in politics, but most people don't actually examine those things. I don't examine those things, so I'm at fault myself. Um, and then um, just to go back to what Trey was saying about um, like finding that like balance, um, I thought it was really interesting. Um, it might've been a quote that you had too, um, but it was something, what we call the human spirit, spirit, our capacity for beauty and love, our drive to create balance in life and moral order in society is an evolutionary accomplishment. Um, so like he kind of, uh, um, the, uh, I can't remember what his name is, but um, you know, part of a lot of what he was doing was suggesting like these biological uh, components. Um, so I thought that was interesting because from that quote, he talks about um, wanting and looking for that, that order um, as being uh, like part of evolution, um, which just kind of went back to what Trey was saying for all of us looking for that. Anybody else? Um, okay, so I have a couple things. Um, so I remember the civil rights movement 50 years ago, right? Um, and the, the big difference this time, first of all, the previous one was actually more violent. And most of my students didn't think that. They thought, oh, Martin Luther King, that was peaceful. But this time, oh, they're really violent. That's not true. <laughs> this one was less, there was less violence percentage wise than there was back then. But of course you don't remember that, right? History gets scrubbed. <laughs> it gets whitewashed and you know, sort of bleached out. But there was, yeah, there were, Martin Luther King had uh, people on, on both sides, people saying you're not aggressive enough and people saying you're too aggressive, right? Um, but the, here's what I, 
here's an idea about when you decide to vote that nobody else is going to tell you. What, what do I vote on the basis of? First of all, each party since 1980, whether it has increased the middle class, whether it's policies increase the middle class, because that's what I care about, right? You, that doesn't have to be what you care about. The next thing though, is his cabinet. You have to, the president appoints the heads of each cabinet, right? You need to find out what those, what those organizations are. My daughter and son-in-law work for one of them. So Department of Labor, Health and Human Services, Environmental Protection, Judiciary, um, the Energy Department, Energy, Department of Defense, Secretary of State. I want you to go, that's, uh, this is what I think you should vote on. You find out what they do. You find out if you think that's worth doing. Because all, you know, I know you guys, oh, Washington, oh, yeah, you know, yeah, 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 get rid of them. Well, you know what? You don't even know what they do, right? And so if you start asking, do you think there should be some minimum wage, like something below which an employer can't go, right? And most students say, well, yeah, there should be some, right? Should there be safety? laws about you can't your employer cannot put you in a dangerous situation should there be laws about that and if you think there should who's going to enforce the laws that's what those departments are as a matter of fact right so i mean if you literally go through what they do you might agree that you think we need it right but you might not right you just have to envision what a world would be like what our society would be like, no minimum wage, no safety protections, no health insurance, no public education, no public transportation, no public parks, no um, unemployment, no retraining for unemployed people, no retraining for returning veterans, no Okay, if you start looking at what they're doing, and then you say, well, how much is it worth? How much are you willing to pay for everybody to have those safety nets, right? And you'll find out it's like 35 bucks, okay? Then there's a National Endowment for the Humanities. And this is where people like me can go in the summer and link with other classical scholars and spend six weeks, eight weeks talking about humanities so we're better humanities teachers. They meet for talking about um, histories that haven't yet been written. And so they can meet together, pool their resources, start writing books about various minorities, marginalized peoples. You can start writing histories about them, right? There's, um, anyway, there's some programs for that. There's programs for bringing kids in the ghetto to go to the symphony or to go to the theater or bringing in puppeteers or uh, playwrights or artists or musicians into the schools, right? So that poor kids get invested in the culture, right? We care about you. We want you to be interested in all this stuff, right? How much do you think it would be worth it per person to have humanities programs. How much should you be willing to pay? It'd be free. Yeah. Well, I mean, the taxpayers have to pay, right? right? It's free for the people in, but it costs money to have the program, right? How much should you be willing to for a humanities program? National Endowment for the Humanities. All right, you guys, is it worth 80 cents to you? 80 cents. My tax money, right? What about artists who don't have to be corrupted by a profit motive? They don't have to kiss up to people and not say what they really think because they're getting funded by the government. You think that's important? Just to have some. Artists, I mean, 
for every artist that applies, you know, only about one in 40 get a grant. You think there ought to be grants? Okay, is it worth 40 cents? <laughs> okay, but we need a strong military. I understand that, right? I, I'm not against a strong military. How much is it worth it to you? How much do you guys pay per person for our military? You guys know? Take a guess. Okay, $2,300, all right? Per person? Yes. So don't you think you ought to know some of that stuff? I think so. <laughs> anyway, you just look at what the cabinet members are, look at what they do, and look at what the budget is, and look at, this is really important, the background of the person put in charge of that, okay? For example, there's a Department of Energy. One of the things it does is prevent us from nuking ourselves, okay? <laughs> We have nuclear weapons in our country, right? The Department of Energy keeps them safe so that terrorist attacks don't come and we end up nuking ourselves. Is that important? Okay. <laughs> and then also, you know, we need to change our energy source, right? So they work on research on green energy or whatever. All right. So there was a presidential candidate who wanted to just to um, completely um, cut out the Department of Energy because it's, you know, those Washingtonians. He didn't even know what it did, okay? Someone told him after he was up there on the stoop saying, we're gonna get rid of the Department of Education, Department of Energy, because we're gonna cut those taxes, right? Well, he didn't even know that's what they did. Well, then, a number of years later, he got appointed to head the Department of Energy, okay? And then the person he replaced that the previous president appointed was a Nobel Prize winning physicist, okay? Do you think you need to know that? That if you vote for one president, he will put a Nobel Prize winning physicist in the Department of Energy and this one will put someone who got C's and D's in college, doesn't care about science, and has um, has has lobby, his political career um, depends upon money from gas and oil, and he's in charge of the energy department of energy, right? So I do think you need to know that. I can't tell you, but and I think you need to know once they got those positions. Did they get kicked out because of corruption or not, right? Don't you think you should know that? If they were exposed for being corrupt or what did they do with their power, right? So the head of the EPA told everyone that worked under him, we're not gonna go on science. We're gonna make all our decisions based on what's good for business, not for the environment, okay. So then I just want you to make a list, right? And so I wish you would consider that in your list of the things you think about when you decide how to vote. That's what, that's what I do, right? So at least I'm saying you could think about this. And um, then to me, the only problem is that you never, no teacher ever says this to you, right? You can get all the way through American history, civics classes, whatever. Nobody ever talks about it, it right? That, to me, that's the big problem that students don't even know. <laughs> I mean, you get told there's a cabinet, maybe you get told, but then you don't get told what they do. You don't get told how much it costs. You don't get told, you know, which presidents over the last 30 years, who they've put on in charge and what that person has done with that power. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I hope maybe you'll consider that. That's what I, I keep track of those things. Um, and I, I, you know, I have access to news where they interview the people who just got appointed. 
and they ask them, well, what is your goal doing this, you know? And so that, that's just an idea for what you might base your vote on. Um, and then with the Black, yeah, the Black Lives Matter, did I say this? 50 years ago, um, the, as opposed to now, there's so many more African-Americans in positions of authority. And it was great, you know? Like they're history teachers and they are mayor, the mayor of Atlanta, the mayor of um, just the mayors of major cities, um, heads of police forces, uh, governors, uh, house representatives. I mean, all these people. So African-Americans really have moved forward, right? But again, like everything else, there tends to be this class split because there is among whites. So that is a big problem. Um, and that's the ultimate divider is class. But anyway, so I do think there's social evolution going on, but this problem with the shrinking middle class might lead to a real devolution, right? Uh, a, you know, a decline in the quality of life. So it's just up to you because um, you're going to pick up at this point and carry on. Um, let's see, who else needs to cover? My gosh, we have four minutes. Uh, we'll have to do the second article next time, okay? But we will keep on the same train because we, I think we can cover three articles next time because we don't have the papers at the beginning. Um, and I think I shouldn't have talked so much, but that was, I hope that's at least fair that I'm not telling you to vote for, I'm just saying, and I'm not even telling you, you have to do the cabinet thing, but maybe you might think about it if you knew what that is. <laughs> Did everybody talk about the Newland? Anybody else? who feels left out because they wanted to talk about Newland. Because some of you might, you know, not be ready yet to do so. Is that fair? But I will ask you next time. So, um, so Caitlin, did you want to talk about Newland? Um, yeah, I guess I'll go ahead and get it out of the way. Okay. Um, so, Really, one of the biggest things that I got from it, I thought it was interesting how he said his like religious beliefs turned into like obsessional thinking because of fear. And I think that I may have gotten off kind of off track, but fear is just such a big like motivator, like especially like it, really regarding anything. And I thought it was interesting how, because even like I can relate, like being religious is kind of like it's kind of scary sometimes and like fear can motivate you to like want to be involved in it because if not you're scared of that punishment and I just thought it was interesting how he said that and I like I quoted or I took one of his quotes and he said it's the fear of chaos that makes us look for order I thought that was also really interesting because like he said um the majority of humans believe in like the monotheistic religions and the looking for order in chaos is just what most people feel like included in safe and it keeps them from that fear of the punishment. So, yeah. Okay, so history is going to say that Americans are gripped by fear right now, right? And ever since 9-11, that has played a much bigger role in our culture than it had before. Um, before that, it was a lot of fantasizing, right? I'm gonna get rich. Um, and now there's this fear. So I, I do think you and your generation are going to have to learn how to deal with fear or you're going to have authoritarianism, right? I think those are your choices. Because um, if you can't figure out how to convince people to fear appropriately, a power-hungry politician will be able to take over by using fear. Does that make sense? And I don't, I mean, that's not, that's not 
telling you to vote for. It's just looking at it from a historical point of view, right? Um, it might be the best thing at a certain situation. I don't know. That's not predictable, but the pattern is, predict is observable and your responsibility is, is pretty obvious. Um, all right, so I'll let you go. It's 7.45 and I appreciate, you know, everything you're saying and I hope all of you feel comfortable in the class, all right? I just want you to feel comfortable and feel like you can, you can speak, speak your mind. And I hope, I hope all of you will feel that you can interrupt me too, you know, I talk a lot. Um, but you can, yeah, I, I like to hear the conversation going, right? I really believe in that when Newland says, if you just listen to people, a lot of the neurotic thinking goes away, right? And, and Lion really is structured that way. And that's, that's really the greatest thing about Lion College is that you can get kids will say, this place is really conservative. This place is really liberal, right? That just means you have a good place. Okay? Okay. So bravo to you. Uh, you deserve a, a shout out to the students. And I'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.